Hi, welcome to Feeding Us, Cooking for a Healthy Pregnancy and Beyond. This is our first virtual class, um, and it's an adaptation of a class that we've been doing successfully over the last 18 months at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's uh, designed to inspire um, you to want to cook in a healthy way and cook delicious things that will allow you to have a healthy weight gain for pregnancy and develop um, patterns of cooking and eating that may be part of your life beyond the pregnancy as well. I'm uh, Susan Hellerstein, a practicing OBGYN at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a generous gift allowed me to pursue this dream of teaching cooking to pregnant women. I've been advising women for years about how to eat in a healthy fashion to gain the right amount of weight and realize that it's hard to put nutrition advice into practice unless you have the cooking skills and you understand how delicious it can be to actually cook healthy food. Um, so the goal of this class is to help you put this advice into practice, to have you understand the simple recommendations and realize that healthy eating can be delicious and you can expand your cooking skills to be able to do it. We want you to try some new foods, some new combinations, learn cooking techniques, and become more confident. So feel free to take today's class and the other classes in our series of five, and tell your friends to join us too. I want to introduce you to the other members of the team. Chef Eva Katz has worked in a various number of roles and is a contributing editor at America's Test Kitchen for years. She's worked in restaurants, catering, recipe publishing, and teaching cooking uh, classes. Um, she's helped us develop this curriculum that involves fresh and delicious foods, practical cooking skills, and kitchen organizational skills. So if you haven't already turned on your oven, please do at 425. Um, Chef Laura Klein is a culinary wellness coach. She's taught a variety of healthy cooking classes in person and virtually. She's combined her business skills and marketing and lifetime medicine experiences with us and helped us deliver uh, this newly um, adapted online virtual cooking class. She has newly acquired chef skills that she'll be helping with teaching future classes with us. Next, we have dietitian Andrea Roche. She's a registered dietitian and certified lactation consultant. She specializes in prenatal and postpartum nutrition as well as lactation counseling. And she has experience both in research and practical coaching. She's super passionate about food and loves to be in the kitchen when she's not with her two young kiddos. Uh, last but not least, we have Sarah Summer, who is an almost college grad from BU and an amazing research and program assistant. She's helped us organize the communications for this class with you and our program in general. General, I'm sure that you've received a number of emails um, or texts from her. So some housekeeping, people may have a variety of uh, experience with Zoom. Please mute your uh, speaker, um, turn your video off if you don't want to be recorded, um, but we will be sure to edit out any recordings of you personally in anything that we share or post. Um, when it comes to the end of the class, we're going to ask you to turn your video back on because we want to see what you've cooked. Um, if you'd like to rename yourself, please do with your first name only and send us questions via the chat box. Uh, recipes are also um, posted in the chat box. So we have a packed hour today. We're going to start with kitchen setup. We're going to go to the kale and sweet potato salad. We'll next make the quinoa stew. We have a nutrition talk about general recommendations in pregnancy. We'll then plate our meals, share what we've made, and answer questions. So welcome to Feeding Us, Cooking for a Healthy Pregnancy and Beyond. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my kitchen. Um, we got a couple great recipes we're going to be making today. Um, before we get started with cooking, I'm just going to show you my, my little setup here, how I like to work. Um, I have a really, really big cutting board. Most people don't have big cutting boards like this, but I recommend using as big as one as you have. 
on a regular basis. If you have a little small little cutting board, I've seen people try and make meals on like little bartender cutting boards. It's not gonna be very efficient. If you have a cutting board kind of like this, that would be good. Um, sometimes these lighter cutting boards can slip around, so I recommend taking a damp cloth and putting it underneath your cutting board so it doesn't move around and this will stabilize it, help you prevent the board from slipping and you cutting yourself. So a little we'll safety tip there. Um, I use my cutting board chopping just about everything, um, like onions, vegetables, bread, you know, pretty much anything except for fruit and meat. Um, I find the fruit picks up some of the odors, flavors from, so I use, um, green cutting board I use for fruits and red cutting board I use for meats. Um, chicken and then these ones can go in the dishwasher or they can be really well scrubbed and that way you're not sort of getting cross-contamination with meats on your nice green cutting board. Um, let's see, um, I like to work with kind of a trash then on my near my cork top, I don't like to move around too much. I think when you you know sort of training in restaurants, you're sort of forced into a little space, which is good because walking around is kind of a waste of time, and you just want to be able to be as efficient as possible. So I grab all my ingredients before I cook, bring them over, so I don't have to walk back to the refrigerator. Um, I use a compost, but if you don't have a compost, you can just use like a little bowl and you put all your debris in your bowl. If you have a trash right near you, that's quite a tip. Um, does everybody have their oven on? Hope so. 425, we're going to start by putting some sweet potatoes in the oven. Um, so we have two recipes. We've got the sweet potato and kale salad, and we have the quinoa stew. We're going to be kind of going back and forth a couple of times. So from recipe to recipe, so I'm going to tell you sort of the, the plan so you know, you know, you can prepare yourself. We're going to start by um, tossing our sweet potatoes and a little bit of um, sp uh, vegetable spray or oil and roasting them. Then we're going to start getting our quinoa stew going. Once that's simmering, we can go back and um, prep our kale for the salad and make the dressing for the salad. And so kind of going back and forth. I'll show you a little bit of nice knife skills while we're going through everything. And if you have any questions, write it up in the chat. Somebody will either answer your question or ask me. And um, all right, so I hope you, had a chance to mise everything. Did you watch any of those videos that we sent you little clips to? How you read your recipe and this is my little mise for the sweet potato salad. I'm just going to take the sweet potatoes for now and I'll put this back. Um, so this is actually kind of a pretty stable potato but sometimes when you have a, a sort of round vegetable that rocks like this. So what I would do before cutting it is just take maybe a little piece off to stabilize it. And I just want to be safe. And we're going to cut these into one inch cubes. You should have yours done. If not, get chopping. All right, so I'm gonna put your sweet potatoes on this baking sheet. Everybody, see this is a rimmed baking sheet. It's not a cookie sheet, and uh, I prefer these for roasting vegetables because they don't warp. I don't know if you've ever put a, a cookie sheet in a hot oven; you'll end up they end up kind of warping on you. So we're gonna roasting vegetables is such an excellent way of. Um, bringing out the flavors, the sweetness, the intensity, the deliciousness of, of vegetables. I know a lot of people who are not fans of a lot of vegetables and then they roast them and they're like, oh, that was good. Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, they're all really great 
green beans, you name it, cabbage wedges, all great, roast it. And it's basically the same concept. So I'm just gonna give this a little bit of a spritz. Salt, pepper. I keep um, a little dish of kosher salt and freshly ground pepper by my workspace. Um, rather than use, I use a lot of pepper, and rather than use a pepper grinder, I just take a little bit of peppercorns every three or four days and grind them in a, um, in a spice grinder. All right, so you spread them out, make sure there's plenty of space. If you have too crowded of a pan, you'll end up sort of steaming your vegetables and they won't brown. So in the oven they go. Set our timers. They take about 25, 30, 35 minutes to roast, but we'll check them halfway through. I'm going to just set my timer for like about 15 minutes just to make sure nothing's crazy is going on. Okay. All right, now I'm going to bring over my knees for the stew. I know a couple people said they had a hard time finding quinoa. Um, and I think we recommended that you can use some uh, quick cooking lentils, like red lentils. I hope that um, that works out for you. Um, so if everybody has time to bring their ingredients over to their workstation, hopefully by their cooktop, we'll get cooking. So quinoa has um, a coating on it. It's a natural coating that protects it. And that coating needs to be washed off. Some packaged quinoas will tell you that it's pre-washed. This one is not pre-washed, so I washed it. And it actually says in the instructions to wash it. So this, um, all right, so we're gonna get started. Turn your pot on to like a medium high and add your olive oil. Let it heat up for a, few, for a minute maybe, just so it gets sort of shimmery. Have yourself like a wooden spoon ready. Oh, actually. Eva, can you show us your mise en place? Because just so we know what that, what, what that looks like, your mise en place for this. Just show us the, see how she has everything out there that is gonna be in the recipe? It makes you be able to do this like the cooking show. And it's a great skill that I've learned from Eva. Um, so we're going to saute some onions and peppers. I have an onion already chopped, and I just want to give you a little quick demo in chopping onions. You cut it halfway through the, through this, the stem, leave the stem intact, take the skins off. The other tip for um, for cooking, you know, just to sort of clean up as you go, do one task at a time. So let's say you had four onions and you need to peel and chop. You would peel them, you would slice them, peel them all first before you start chopping them. Then you do the chopping. So this way you've gotten rid of your debris and you have room on your cutting board. All right, so this is a fairly small onion, easy to handle. Um, and I'm gonna just, cut down lengthwise, sort of along the ribs. You see, I'm holding my knife mostly on the base, but I have a little bit grabbing onto the, um, the knife part of the, the, the metal of the knife. All right, and then I use, my, I keep my fingertips um, tucked under, and I use the knuckles to guide the knife blade. This way, when I push the knife down, I'm not gonna cut on my fingertips. I keep the tip of the knife on the cutting board and I do sort of a motion, a, like a sigh motion, um, not a sigh motion, but just an up and down motion, keeping the tip on the, the board. If you have a really large onion that's kind of hard to manage, you can cut your, your, your onion in half and sort of make quarters out of it. And you can cut it this way. And then you can actually turn it around, cut it again a couple times, and then you get a nice small dice. 
without having to go back and re-dice it. All right, so for the uh, red pepper, I'm just gonna cut around the ribs and the core. And I'm just gonna maybe take out some of this white pith and small kind of quarter inch cubes. So I've made So we hope that you have um, been able to prepare in advance because we don't expect anyone to be able to cut quite as quickly as Eva. But um, if you haven't, this time, next class, try to get everything prepared beforehand because it's hard to keep up with Eva. All right, back to the cooktop. All right, heating, I'm heating up my oil and my onions. Hey Eva, how can you tell um, when the oil is hot enough to start cooking? So I'm looking for it to shimmer a little bit, kind of like it's like uh, little waves on, like on the oil. Also gets a little fragrant too. The other thing I like to use, I know a lot of people don't have these, but if you have a bench scraper that you would use normally for pastries, they're a great tool to keep on your, uh, in your workstation, scooping things up. Rather than using your knife, which isn't a good idea. I do it, but, all right. Let's get your onions and peppers in the pot. Okay. So the other ingredients in this recipe kind of has a little bit of a Southwest West flavor. You can change up this flavor profile. Instead of using the chipotles, which I have, which are smoked jalapenos, uh, they ha they're just like packed so much flavor in them. They come in these cans. I don't have the can with me anymore, but you know, they're just, they're just wonderful. They slip such a big flavor in there and add so much depth to cooking. But if you wanted to go Indianish, you could just skip this, maybe add some, garam masala um, or some harissa and you can do kind of a Moroccan flavor. I mean, I, there's a, a lot of things you can do with the same ingredients and just changing up your flavor profile. So we got the vegetables softening. Got to give it a few minutes. Um, I'm using, this is super, you know, the, the, the ingredients are super versatile too. So you can flavor, the profile is for some of the ingredients. I've chosen to use frozen lima beans. The black beans are great. Uh, edamame is great. Kidney beans are good. I'm using frozen corn, a great cancer, a great thing to keep in your freezer. Everybody sizzling away? Everybody's good so far. <laughs> And also, Ava, um, somebody didn't have lentils, and so and they didn't have um, red lentils, so they asked about green lentils, which I said were fine. They just take a little longer to cook. Uh, asking if green lentils are fine to use. Yes. Okay. So if you have, if you're using lentils, what you're going to have to keep an eye on is just the cooking time. So we're going to put in all this sort of the aromatic, the spice, the stock, the tomatoes, and your grain. And before you add your corn and your um, beans, maybe just check to make sure that your lentils are cooked enough. If they're not, just give it a little bit more time. And if you're worried about things like evaporating, you can always add a little bit more water. And just give it a little bit more time. I'm sure it's gonna be fine. I just can't guarantee it's gonna cook in the 15 minutes or the three months. But I think we should be okay. Great, thank you. All right. So my onions are getting golden. Give it a couple, maybe one or two more minutes. Making a lot of noise over here. Noise. Um, Gabe, um, I think your hand might be over the uh, speaker a little bit. It's a little hard to hear, Eva. 
I think I fixed it. Thank you. All right. So now I'm going to add my garlic, my chipotle that I've chopped up, and the spices. We got cumin, coriander, and sweet paprika. If you don't have sweet paprika, you can just skip all those spices and add chili powder, which is basically kind of what we, those flavors, cumin, coriander, paprika are already in chili powder. So that's an option too. And what we're doing now is by cooking the spices in the, in the oil, we're kind of blooming them, waking them up, and we're just going to get a better flavor in our end product by taking this step. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to add my broth. I'm using a vegetable broth. And I'm going to use the, the bottom of the uh, wooden spoon to kind of scrape up any kind of brown bits on the bottom of the pan. That stuff is flavor. Okay, the tomatoes and quinoa. Salt. I meant to add some salt with the onions, but all right. So, one of the things about seasoning is it's a really good idea to season along the way rather than just once. I know some people are concerned about the amount of salt that, they're, that they eat, but I think by using, um, by salting it in different stages, you might end up actually using less salt at the end, right? at the end, because you the ingredients are kind of absorbing the salt as they go along. Um, imagine sort of like how hard it is to season like a green bean if the water that you cooked in it wasn't salty. It's almost impossible to get, to get that salt in those green beans. So, um, all right. So we're gonna bring this to a boil and then we're gonna lower it and let it simmer for a little while. I'm gonna move, to rearrange everybody. Um, if you have, Take a minute to kind of rearrange yourself and get the uh, kale ready to prep. We're gonna do this together. As you notice in the recipe, I told you not to do this ahead of time. Um, Cause we're gonna do it together. I'm gonna show you how to do it. So I'm using Tuscan kale, which is my favorite. It's called dinosaur kale. But you can use curly kale, you can use collard greens. Um, what we're going to do is hold the stock upright and then you use your fingers and you kind of slide down the sides of the stock and you leave the stock, the core behind, the stuff, you know, and then you just get the leaves. All right, everybody, give it a go. Can you use baby kale? If you're going to use baby kale, that's fine but you may not want to massage it quite as long or quite as vigorously as we will. Um, if you it have does. really small little leaves like this, I think it's okay to leave the, the core on. It's really just the more fibrous, the thicker fibrous ones. So just cut that off. And what about um, Swiss chard? I'm going through the motion of doing all this step first. All right, and then getting rid of, and then we'll go back and we'll do the chopping. And I've washed all my greens ahead of time. You can definitely chop these and wash these afterwards. But I have been washing just about everything really thoroughly, you know, and I find that doing it ahead of time saves me time now. But anyway, um, speaking of washing vegetables, I do, I wash, um, even things that you would think to wash, like avocados and oranges and lemons, because I feel like even though we're not maybe not using the, the skins, this little stuff, this is all totally fine. We don't need with that. Ava, we have a question about um, Swiss chard. Can you use Swiss chard instead of Absolutely. Okay. What Absolutely. about spinach? Spinach okay? Anything. You still want to remove the stalks. Oh, spinach? What about spinach? Uh, you can use spinach. Um, it's definitely a gentler kind of gentle flavor and a gentler 
or um, you know texture. Um, but I don't see why not. Just not going to do it the massaging at all. It will just end up with. Is somebody using spinach in there? Has anybody got spinach? Somebody um, was asking if they could substitute. I don't think they're using it tonight, but they were just asking. Um, oh, okay. All right. So all of my stems have been removed, and now I'm going to take the greens and chop them into kind of two inch pieces. And then put them in a bowl. All right, I'm lowering my stew. So it's just sort of a gentle simmer. Oh, back to washing. Okay, my beaver went off. I'm gonna check on my sweet potatoes. Looking good. <laughs> Nothing burnt. I'll set my timer for another 10 minutes. Okay, I'll set 15 minutes at least, yeah. How's everybody going with their kale? Everybody looks good so far. You will all have some catch up time because we're going to do a little talk about uh, nutrition and pregnancy. So if you're falling behind, don't worry. So I was talking about washing vegetables and why I wash things like avocados and um, I don't know if I finished that train of thought, but the reason why I wash those, those, those vegetables and fruits as well is once you cut into them, you know, with a knife, something from the exterior of that avocado could get into the interior and um, so. And I was doing that before COVID, but now that I'm doing it even a little bit more rigor, sort of religiously. All right. Always cleaning as I go. All right. I hope everybody's almost done with their um, kale. Um, I'm going to get ready with the dressing. All right, so I've got some shallots, some diced shallots. I, I chopped them up just like I chopped those um, onions, same concept. A little bit of garlic, smoked paprika. This is just another one of these sort of secret ingredients like chipotle. They have, so, they have a little smokiness. They have so much flavor. I think of like chipotle as sort of the bacon of the vegetarian world. So much flavor. Um, some sherry vinegar. If you don't have sherry vinegar, you can use rice wine vinegar. I mean, yeah, rice wine vinegar or red wine vinegar or white vinegar. And a little salt, pepper. And we'll give it a little bit of a whisk with the oil. Eva, do you do this mise en place even when you're doing cooking for yourself and not our little cooking? Depends. It depends on what I'm making, Susan. That's a really good question. Um, if I'm, you know, if I'm trying new recipes, I tend to like to have things organized so I can just concentrate on the recipe and make sure I don't make mistakes. I'm baking. I always try and mise en place things. I might mise things together so I'm not using a million little cups. Um, if I, I um, if I'm making a stir fry, absolutely. Everything is ready before I hit the stove because the stir fry goes like that. You don't want to be, you know, you gotta, you're doing things on high heat and it's fast, you can't be chopping anything. If I'm making a stew, 
and I'm browning my meat, and I know that that's going to take me 10 minutes. I will start that process and I will do some prepping on the side. You know, it's basically how to best use your time. Um, so I have some peanuts here and I just want to show you a way of you can crush them. It's just using the bottom of a bowl. A little easier than a knife, but you definitely can use a knife too if you want to. This works really well with peanuts. Not so much with other nuts. Uh, pretty good with cashews. Almonds are a little hard. Um, walnuts, it's okay. It doesn't have to be super even. It's kind of a rustic dish. We're going to take half of the peanuts and put them in the uh, dressing. Okay. Now we're going to get dirty. We're going to add our chopped kale to the bowl with the dressing. This is a great, great salad to, for make ahead. I mean, kale just, you can, you can make this salad. This is a great for batch cooking because you can make this salad and put them in four different little containers and you've got four like lunches that you can bring to the office if you ever go back to the office to work with that. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but anyway. Um, so we're massaging. Who ever thought you'd be massaging a vegetable? But we're giving this kale, breaking down the fiber so it's more palatable, it's more digestible. It's like, it's, um, it's a pretty, pretty fibrous vegetable. This just makes it so much more pleasant to eat, massaging it. And of course, we all washed our hands for the 20 seconds before we started. Oh, yes. Sorry, I meant to start with that, didn't I, Susan? Oh, well. I mean, I did. I washed my hands before I got going, but I meant to have everybody do it together. Just as a reminder. Eva, um, if we don't have shallots, what could you use instead? Oh, you can use a little red onion, maybe use like a quarter of a cup of red onion. Um, you can use some scallion, scallion whites. Um, you can use white onion, anything. I mean, shallots are just a mild onion. So that's a good question. All right, I think this is good. So it's sort of, it's sort of the volume has kind of gone down a little bit. All right, I'm gonna go wash my hands. I'm gonna give you all a minute to catch up. And um, so I think this is a good time to talk nutrition. Um, we've got another eight to ten minutes on the timer for the sweet potatoes. So why don't we go, that, I think it's a good time. Why don't we um, go to Andrea? Andrea, sorry. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, my name is Andrea and I am a registered dietitian and lactation consultant. Um, today we're gonna to kind of talk basics of nutrition and pregnancy. Um, so one of the, the main messages we want to get across, um, if we can switch the slide um, to our beautiful balanced plate. Um, yeah, so you'll see here, basically this is, this is the main message we wanna get across, is that we're really focusing on fruit and veggies forward. So if you take a typical dinner plate, for example, cut it in half, ideally half of your plate should be fruits and or veggies. Um, so going, yeah, um, and then you, um, on that other half, slice that other half in half. So you've got two quarters, essentially. And on one quarter of that plate, you've got a healthy starch or grain. Um, we've got a whole other session where we're going to talk, you know, really focus on healthy grains and how quality is what matters. Um, same thing with protein. Uh, focusing on lean quality proteins. And then you'll notice these other components of the plate, healthy fats. Um, definitely want to watch portion sizes, but every meal really should contain a healthy fat as it helps you absorb most of the nutrients that are in the fruits and veggies. Um, then dairy, and that can include non-dairy. And the focus here is during pregnancy, we need a lot more calcium. Um, also good source of protein. And then fluids, don't forget to keep the fluids up. Water is always the best option. Um, 
One other message we like to make is, um, you know, when you're thinking about portion sizes, a serving of protein, a lot of people ask, what is that? Well, you know, it's basically the palm of your hand. Um, a serving of vegetables would be one fist. Um, a serving of carbs would be a cupped hand. So hopefully you guys can see me. And then a serving of fats is about one thumb. Um, so kind of using the hand method to think of portion control. Uh, so looking at the next slide, um, you'll see here, this is a perfectly balanced breakfast plate. Half the plate um, are, are fruits, one quarter whole grain, another quarter lean protein, and then that avocado there to kind of tie everything together with that healthy fat and a little non-fat Greek yogurt for some added protein and calcium. Um, and then um, when we are out and about, again, if that ever happens again, this is what a perfectly balanced lunch might look like. Um, and then for dinner, um, you see here, again, half the plate, veggies, one quarter lean protein, one quarter grain. Um, so then looking at, or talking about weight gain during pregnancy, this is, this is not the time to start losing weight. Weight gain is definitely expected. Um, and the rate of weight gain is, uh, depends on your pre-pregnancy weight or BMI. Definitely something to speak with your midwife or OB during all of your um, visits. So if we look at this next chart here, um, the next slide. So this shows you, uh, if you look at that first column, what your pre-pregnancy weight or BMI was. Um, so if you don't know this, this is definitely something to ask your uh, healthcare provider about. And then you can kind of gauge how much weight you should be gaining per trimester. Um, so this is, uh, I believe this is gonna be on our website if you wanna look at this in more detail. Uh, but again, always something good to bring up during your, your office visits. Um, in terms of calories, um, we really want to avoid the mentality of eating for two. That would mean, uh, you know, an additional 1,800 to 2,000 calories for most of us. Um, and yeah, babies just don't need that much. So, um, and also focusing more so on quality again, rather than quantity of the food. Um, you'll notice here for second trimester, recommendation is around 340 extra calories. That's a large snack or maybe two small snacks or a small meal. And then third trimester, you know, as we get a little bigger, um, we want to focus more on around 450 extra calories per day. And that's, that's about a typical meal. Um, and then again, looking at your weight gain pattern, which is something you can work with your healthcare team or registered dietitian on. Um, and then, Food safety, this is more important than ever. Um, but, um, you know, kind of some of the general recommendations while pregnant, we want to avoid the undercooked and raw foods. So unfortunately, no sushi, no runny eggs, uh, no poached eggs. Uh, in terms of fish, it's the mercury that we're most concerned about. Um, and that's found in those big fish. So that's gonna be like king mackerel, marlin, orange ruffy, swordfish, shark, tilefish, and most tuna. Uh, in terms of deli meats, uh, definitely don't wanna eat these cold. Um, it's typically recommended to, to avoid most deli meats, but uh, some can be eaten safely if they are heated to steaming, uh, which can be done in the microwave or stovetop. In terms of pasteurization, we usually just associate this with milk products, but um, even juices can often be unpasteurized. Um, what you want to do is look at the label. If it's pasteurized, it will say so on the label. Same thing with cheeses. It will always say the first ingredient, if it's pasteurized, will say pasteurized cow's milk. Um, and then caffeine, um, one of the hardest things to, to limit while pregnant for many women, uh, keep this to uh, two cups or less per day. Uh, in terms of teas, most grocery store teas are safe but I would avoid anything that says detox, cleansing, or medicinal. Um, another thing, you know, if you have more questions, you can certainly um, ask us, but also good questions to ask during your, your healthcare uh, visits. Um, artificial sweeteners, this is another thing a lot of women ask about. Um, typically, I recommend avoiding the blue or the pink stuff. 
and that the green and the yellow stuff, so your stevia and your Splenda are probably okay. Just don't go too overboard. Um, and yeah, looking at the next slide, um, we thought this was pretty relevant to discuss some food safety in quarantine. Um, so, you know, as best as possible, minimizing our trips to the grocery store and planning ahead. So if you aren't one to meal plan, this is a great time to start that practice. Um, so, you know, meal planning for two weeks and prioritizing fresh foods over first. So when you do go into the grocery store, go to the fresh food produce section first, uh, make a list. Uh, not only will that help with meal planning, but it'll get you in and out more quickly. Um, and then of course, timing, you know, shop early or late, consider delivery or curbside pickup. Um, and this is also a great time to prepare more home cooked meals, which hopefully we're inspiring you right now to do that uh, with this class. And then food delivery options and takeout. Um, a lot of people are opting for uh, those meal delivery or those food delivery programs such as HelloFresh, where everything is already chopped and prepared. You just get to put it all together in the end. Um, and then in terms of takeout, you know, avoiding contact with the delivery person. So often over the phone, you can provide payment without a signature and just leave instructions, please leave at my front door. Um, when the food does come in the house, I recommend putting it immediately in your sink and transferring the food to other containers. And of course, wash your hands. Um, do we have time to talk about nutrients or should we get back to Eva? I think we can I think we need to check on our sweet potatoes. Okay. Everybody, how's the sweet potatoes going? Mine are done. Okay, you want to show them a picture of what mine looks like? Spotty brown, nice caramelization. And we also want to put our lima beans if our quinoa is done. My quinoa is definitely done. If you're working with lentils, check them, see what the texture's like, make sure that they're kind of, these don't go in for very long, but I'm going to put my, my beans and corn in, stir that in. All right. And how's everybody doing? Can you give me a thumbs up? All right. So, um, anybody have any questions? Okay. So, I am going to plate my sweet potato salad, my kale salad. I'm putting the kale and the dressing down first. Um, And this salad is so delicious. It's like, and it's it's special enough. It's different enough that you might want to do it for entertain. If you're entertaining, if you ever do that again, you can do that. Um, so my sweet potatoes on top, and the rest of my peanuts. And I gave you a recipe for pickled jalapenos, kind of a little bonus recipe. You're welcome for the bonus, but uh, I love the flavors of something pickled with almost everything. So, but if you don't have them, um, so I had some already done, but I also have some freshly chopped ones. So if you're gonna use a fresh one, which I think it's just equally delicious, you could just put a little bit on, that if you're using the pickled ones because they're milder there's a little sweetness in them you can use the rings if you want and pickled vegetables pickled onions I should just add like such a pop of flavor and acid to your recipes your food it's just delicious so is everybody at a point where they can flatter their their um their salad, or you could just leave it in the bowl and just put your sweet potatoes on top. That's fine too. Ava, um, does the sweet potatoes need to be cool before you put them on top of the salad? No, no, they can. You can do them ahead of time. They don't have to be. Totally flexible. Great question. Um, so the sweet potato, the stew is looking really good. The thing about the quinoa stew is as it sits, so it looks more like a soup now. 
But if you waited until later on this evening to eat this, it probably thick up, thicken up, it'll be more like a porridge. It's delicious like that, but if you prefer it a little brothier, butter or a little bit more broth. Um, it's, it's perfectly normal and it's equally delicious. So it's not really a problem. I am gonna taste this before I just have like a taste of the spoon so I'm not dipping my spoon back in there. Tastes great. Doesn't need a thing. So, um, I have some recommendations for things that I like to serve with this. And that includes some queso fresca or feta cheese. I'm using feta cheese. And some cilantro. You can put the cilantro in the, I probably will put a little bit on top and then stir some of this in this. Avocado that I washed. Just scoop up Notice that I flipped it over and just again for stability. I'm all about like preventing accidents. So I I could have cut it kind of cup side up, but it might have rolled around. I might have slipped my knife. Eva, do you cut cilantro with the stems or do you take the stems off? Yes, I, 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 I leave some of the stems on. There's a lot of flavor in stems. Um, so when I'm chopping cilantro, I leave some of the stems on and I'm gonna, I bunch it up, kind of grab it up, make a ball of it in my hand. Then I grab my knife and start chopping. And I'm going for kind of a rough chop, almost like a slice. That's it. Doesn't have to be too fine. All right. So I'm going to, have to put it in there. Go ahead and do that. And again, this soup is great for batch cooking. You can portion them out. Have four portions. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that these two recipes are like mental be eaten together, but they could. I, I, I think this would be delicious as a side to um, like a roast chicken or a grilled steak. It's great on its own for a lunch. Maybe have a hard boiled egg for some protein, extra protein. Um, anyway, I just want to know if anybody has any questions out there. How'd it go for you? Um, can you, um Tell us when to put the lime in, or is that just a garnish? Oh, right. You squeeze a little lime. I was wondering if anybody has uh, been able to keep up, and if you could aim your camera onto your what you have been able to cook. I, it's a challenge to keep up with Eva, but um, if anybody could just aim their camera or their computer. Hold on one second. I'm just going to take us off of this view and see if we can all see. Oh, something good. Emmy, that looks delicious. And Jack, 